Hello, everybody. My name is Cynthia Brian Kate. I've been a Green since 2008. Uh, I'm a vice chair and do various town representative things for the Green Party of Suffolk County on Long Island. I'm a member of the National Women's Caucus of the Green Party, the Lavender, Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, Intersex, Queer, Asexual, and Related People's Caucus. I'm a member of the Forming Disability Caucus, and I help advise the Young Eco-Socialist Caucus. I'm on several committees, including, and basically I've been doing education on biological sex, gender identity and expression, and sexual orientation diversity for a bit over 20 years to borderline of quarter of a century. I help run stuff for two intersex rights organizations, and I've given over a thousand workshops and panels on all these topics. So that's kind of why I'm here today. And today's workshop title is how to be respectful in a gender diverse environment. Am I getting the title right? Can you folks hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So Good. what exactly would gender roles in a the definitions be? I take it you're asking for definitions of the basic terms on this. Okay, because the thing is, a lot of, in a lot of uh, times, people have conflated, let's see, sexual orientation, gender identity slash expression, and biological sex. So let's start with those three. Biological sex refers to reproductive biology, which for years and decades and longer, people assumed was only male or female. And that's not exactly accurate. Intersex is the current term to, that refers to anybody who's biologically in between what's expected of the standards for defining male and female. And that can refer to variations in chromosomes, hormones, genital structures, internal or external, and any and all other sex characteristics. And while this wasn't talked about for the longest time, research that I have actually met with people who've done that research. Intersex people may be as common as at least on the order of like one out of 10 people. And that research that I'm quoting is 20 years out of date. So there's probably a lot more people that are being counted and who are coming out and coming forward about their lives and experiences now. That's biological sex. Oh, quick thing on biological sex. Chimera, chimerism and chimeras. The term comes from Greek myth for a mutant super creature. <clears throat> in, in this context, a chimera is when twins, triplets, or other multiple fetuses merge inside the womb in order to create a person born with a composite body. Not all chimeras are intersex, but if the siblings are fraternal siblings of different sexes, you wind up with somebody who is an intersex chimera which I actually happen to be. I am biologically in between male and female, have had two distinct puberties, and have a body which, if you could see me on video, is very markedly and noticeably in between because I was supposed to be at least twins, if not triplets, had we been able to be born singly. <laughs> see, the stuff is not as simple and simplistic as pop culture, the media, or popular stereotypes lead us to believe. So that's sex. <clears throat> Gender is actually all the categories and categorizations and standards and uh, expectations and assumptions made about people and that people make based on things like masculinity and femininity. You have the identities of man and woman. It's just a lot of the assumptions and definitions were made in years and decades past when people thought that's all there is. <clears throat> and like, like the topic's title says, a gender diverse environment, everywhere is a gender diverse environment because for decades now, people have been 
coming out about their lives. People have been talking about their experience. People are coming forward and saying, I am not what people expected. I do not fit these assumptions. This is not me. And there are so many people that could say this and are saying this. Uh, gender identity is your internal known experienced, uh, uh, experience of whether you're a man, a woman, whether you know yourself as those, or whether you know yourself to be someone else entirely, to slightly misquote a Kate Warnstein book title on the subject. <clears throat> gender expression is how we signal this to the world, clothing, hair, makeup, jewelry, uh, what you do with stuff, how you express your interests, your hobbies, all that kind of stuff. I mean, even some hobbies are put into gender categories. The most stereotypical one I can think right now is knitting, interior design, uh, car repair. I come from a construction family. I'm a girly girl from a construction family. Go figure. But that's gender expression. Gender role is how you feel that your life fits whatever your gender is. And that's kind of what all the, uh, that's what all the assumptions have figured into. The idea that, okay, you're born, a doctor looks between your legs, doesn't necessarily maybe know intersexes, assumes you're male or female, even though I just mentioned how many people are intersex. And then uh, you're raised by usually a well-meaning, hopefully loving family who think, okay, society told us that these are the expectations for somebody with this kind of biology. And some people are okay with how they were raised on this, and some people it doesn't fit. And that's actually where we come to the other categories I'm going to mention. <clears throat> yeah, gender role is basically what you do, I think is kind of what you do with all that. And yeah, that brings us to transgender, non-binary, non-conforming. Am I right? Moving along with the notes I have. Yes, you're right on task. <laughs> okay, transgender can refer to transgender and cisgender. One's been talked about a bit more than the other, but both actually are related to each other because they come from chemistry terms. Uh, cis means pretty much like the same or same side as uh, trans is kind of the opposite of that. Cisgender refers to anyone whose gender identity actually matches what they, the, the sex and gender assumptions assigned to them when they were born. <laughs> and people do conflate sex and gender, as I said, so I'm trying to keep that uh, as clear as I can on this. <clears throat> Transgender refers to people who in any way do not under, who do not experience, live as, identify, know themselves to be what they were expected to be. And that could be the opposite gender. That could be a whole different gender entirely. <clears throat> and that includes transgender women and transgender men, people who you know, people who assumed that they would grow up to be men but grew up to be women. I myself happen to be a transgender woman, which when people ask me, but how can you be intersex and trans? If you, how can you be trans if you're intersex? My explanation is either I can say what I said before, that sex and gender identity are two distinct things, or I can say I was raised by a loving, well-meaning, clueless family to be a guy, and I grew up to be a woman instead. Kind of happens. Actually, quite a lot of it happens for a lot of people. <laughs> that all trans men, that's basically somebody who was assumed to grow up to be a woman and grew up to be a man instead. Trans men are men, trans women are women. Our party has actually made that clear, including that we have the gender self determination in the, uh, <clears throat> in the platform for this national party. It's mentioned in the 10 key values. <laughs> then we have non-binary. Non-binary, basically, well, binary is that something is one or the other. Non-binary people do not identify or know themselves or live as one or the other of the two 
stereotypically expect the genders that I've mentioned are stereotypes. The stereotype is that everybody's just one or the other. <clears throat> Non-binary people come in as vast a range as any other bunch of people. <clears throat> and the one thing that I will say about non-binary people, since I actually do not identify as non-binary myself, but I have a lot of friends who do, uh, is that non-binary people, as I said, do not consider themselves to be exactly a man or exactly a woman. They may be somewhere in between. They may be somewhere outside. That's where we get a term like agender, which are people who do not identify as having a gender that can exactly be defined. I have a friend whose kid has turned out to identify as agender, and we're still figuring out what pronouns they want to be known as. <laughs> and that's another, uh, that's the next spot that I'm jumping ahead, because gender nonconforming. This is possibly one of the broadest categories, because <laughs> all that it really means is people who do not uh, go along with the expectations, assumptions, and stereotypes of their gender. And that does not mean that they're transgender, intersex, or non-binary, though they might be. This can fall under just about anybody. I mean, I remember back when Avril Lavigne wore the necktie and a man's shirt with the miniskirt, and everybody <clears throat> was on MTV saying, oh, but is she trans now? Uh, no, she was simply not conforming to expectations for somebody expected to be a girl. And people conflate gender identity and expression with biological sex with sexual orientation. <laughs> As I said, biological sex is often being conflated with what your gender identity is going to be. That male is man and female is woman when that is not always true. Well, it's also conflated with sexual orientation. <clears throat> the, that's why the stereotypes about gay and lesbian people in particular are not about sexual behavior. They're about gender behavior. The stereotype of the highly feminine gay man and the hypermasculine lesbian woman. And there are people who identify on those areas of gender. It's where we have the butch and femme communities for people who are very highly masculine or very highly feminine. <clears throat> yeah, basically, people can have conflated all this, and that's why we need to be more respectful and more aware of this. And that's where we get this metrosexual term from. That was basically trying to deal with all the stereotypes that conflate the three categories. My brother is cisgender. He's heterosexual. He's also thin, neat, well-dressed, meticulous in every detail of, oh, you just spilled a crumb on the coffee table, and he teaches art. All of these are, particularly back when I was a kid in the 1970s, very stereotypically assumed to not be something a heterosexual cisgender guy would be doing. There was even a really bad Saturday Night Live sketch called Lyle the Effeminate Heterosexual, where the poor guy had to prove he was hetero for the whole series. Oh, my God. So this is a lot of the categories, <clears throat> and I hope that this makes sense to people, because this is a topic that people are taught so many times should be simple, should be, uh, pun intended, straightforward. No, gender is not always a linear, quick, easy thing. As I told an author I met once, no, gender is a confusing, messy mishmash that people think they understand and have to figure out later. Because, you know, <clears throat> okay, kids know often what they identify as. It's just the words are not always available. I grew up in a small town where no one talked about any of this stuff until college. I am glad that it's changing, especially because of workshops like this one, because all the... Uh, people who've come forward, all the books, including the memoir and documentary books. I mean, I came out as a trans woman in 1996. I was the first person I knew in my town. Nobody, I couldn't find anything in the media. I don't know, my first girlfriend trying to help me feel better about where I was trying to figure out I was. What's it been? Maybe five years now? We've had at least 
if nothing else, that reality show I Am Jazz told me, wow, there was a kid who came out at four on this stuff and managed to make it to having two published books in a TV show. That shows it is progress, but we need to work at it, including by trying to be aware of and understand all of this stuff. Okay, please, dear moderator, is there anything you want to throw in of this? Well, that pretty much has the background. Now, perhaps we could talk about what the solution is and how to show respect in the uh, workplace. How do we challenge those assumptions and revise the way we um, treat each other as coworkers? Well, that's one thing, definitely work environments need to be respectful. And work environments, I mean to cover lots of things. I would probably use it to cover everywhere we live and experience life because we're working at that. But if you want to narrow it down at least slightly, I'll say schools, which are definitely workplaces, both for the people who teach there and the people who are, who are learning there. Workplaces like jobs and such. <clears throat> And we're in the Green Party. We're here at the annual national meeting of the United States Green Party. That is a work environment, both the national party, our state parties, and our locals. So first of all, being aware that gender is not as simple as a binary thing for everyone. And that includes actually finding out uh, <clears throat> what people's pronouns are if you're not sure. You can ask. The worst case that will happen is somebody might not answer you. But it's better to ask and maybe feel a bit dorky than assume and disrespect somebody's pronouns, their gender identity, their expression. No, it, I feel it's always better to ask. That includes respecting people's preferred pronouns, preferred names, preferred forms of address. Cynthia Brian Kate is not the name that was put on my paper when I was born, but it's the name that I have been using and knowing myself by. And everybody in the whole darn Green Party, from uh, whoever's running for dog catcher in my town up to President of the United States, knows me by. <clears throat> and I simply ask that people res respect that, and that's the thing. And this extends to not just uh, people in the gender spectrums. Uh, for a cisgender heterosexual example of this, my family are all Western junkies. The Duke, John Wayne, that wasn't his birth name. He was Marion Morrison. He changed a very Irish name to a more stereotypically masculine name. So if we can have that, we certainly can respect trans, intersex, non-binary, gender non-conforming people, and anyone else who might not fall into any of the categories I've mentioned because this is a pretty brief overview. Frankly, I hear gender terms on Tumblr every five minutes that make me think I don't know much. And that's the point. We don't know everything. The jo our job is not to know every single word ever coined. Our job is to try being respectful, to try listening, and not just la, 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 I heard you say this once and I'm just going to breeze past you. No, actually listen. If, I, if, if, if one person messes up another's pronouns, the person whose pronouns got messed up's job is to say, sorry, you got this wrong. And the person who messed it up's job is to say, oh my God, I'm so sorry, and make sure they don't do it again. An accidental you know, not knowing is one thing. Then you can actually talk about it. Even if this is the two second interaction I just modeled. But if somebody has made it clear I wish to be called this and referred to as this, or I'm, I'm known as this, but I'd rather be known as that. And the, and the other person is choosing to not respect that. Then that's what is known as a microaggression, which is pretty much something which is, which is considered small, but actually hurts as much as big, or at least is in the same family because it's still not respecting. So respecting is the key thing and being open to talking about this. I mean, part of the problem is when people haven't had conversations about this, when their family hasn't thought to tell them about this, when a school hasn't thought to tell them about this. One of the biggest fixes, if, if, if anything could be said to be fixable rather than evolving, rather than growing, is education. 
chance to have workshops like this one and not just do it once, hit and quit and say, well, we, we had the lady from this group or this guy or this person or we don't even know what their pronouns are. We had them once and we're done. No, this will probably have to be a conversation that goes on a while. And you will have to have people checking in with each other to make sure they know to be respectful. And, and in that terms brings of, us... What's that? And so I was just going to say, so that brings us to the next part of your panel, which was asking questions for the audience. Well, I wanted to say one other thing quickly. Okay. Schools and workplaces, including the Green Party, need to have <clears throat> some mechanisms in place. And I think we're still working on this across the board to empower people who are gender diverse to address incidents ranging from just accidental uh, cluelessness all the way up to outright people being bullies or intentionally disrespectful. And there needs to be some kind of process in place for every workplace to address, deal with, and hopefully redress all this. Now, I would love questions, but I felt that needed to be said, because that's the whole point of this workshop. That last sentence, I think, sums it up. Um, Chanel Stack, I have a question, but I also have a statement. Which comes first? You pick. OK. So statement wise, I just wanted to say, go back for a second to microaggressions, because I don't think most people realize that this assumption that because someone is not a typical gender, that they are somehow a danger to children or someone who isn't who they say they are, therefore is dangerous to someone, is a, that's a microaggression that can get someone killed which is why it's important to make a point to respect the names and or pronouns and or everything else that people give to themselves and tell you about themselves. Because at the end of the day, when you choose to ignore the fact that someone chooses to use weird neo pronouns like zero self or Z self, they're telling you this, they're being open with you, telling you this important thing about themselves. And they've, you know, been struggling and fighting for a little bit of acceptance. It's a point to make it that you, even when that person isn't around, if you truly give half a crap about that person, you get their pronouns right, you get their name right, you don't allow someone to dead name them when they're not around because that is the truth as to whether or not you actually truly want to be that person's ally or that you even have a monochrome of respect for them. Okay, I'll just say one quick thing since I'm sorry I didn't even cover it. Dead naming. For folks in the audience who haven't heard the word, that is using a name that a person no longer uses, no longer wants to use, and does not feel fits them. And that, as Chanel said, can cause trouble. It can cause trouble because then people are outed as being a gender other than the one that uh, they are presenting as. It can cause trouble in the workplace. It can cause trouble in schools. And yes, it can lead to people being murdered by gender hating bigots. So dead naming is a big no-no. Don't do it. If you accidentally do it, apologize and make sure you don't do it again. Is that what you would say on this, Chanel? Yeah, pretty much. Also, always remember that just because someone's someone looks a certain way, don't assume because of their gender presentation at that moment that they're not a trans person. I know plenty of non-binary trans films that have facial hair because they have to protect themselves. When my non-binary trans femmes do not wear their facial hair, they're subject to getting basically hate crime. So, you know, that's a protective measure they have to take. They don't like it, it causes dysphoria, but it's necessary. And for Over. people who don't know what that means, dysphoria is a pr profound sense of being uncomfortable with yourself, with your body, with the stuff that you're expected to be and do it comes from a Greek word, which means something to do with heavy burdens. My first girlfriend was Greek. She taught me a couple of nice words and a couple of not so nice words. 
And yeah, not all pronouns are just he or she. My pronouns may be she, her, hers, but I know so many people that use pronouns that I can't even pronounce. And we have another form of address instead of just Mr., Ms., and Mrs. We also have Chanel. Can you help me? Is the other one that's like MX, is that Ms., Migs? How do you pronounce that if you know? Mix. Thanks. I have five friends that use it and I can't pronounce it. Never said I was perfect, but I'm at least trying here. You get better with that's the point. We are supposed to at least try to get this right. If we're not perfect, then we're supposed to sit down and have a conversation like you and I just had. That's oh. at the heart of this. Okay, the next question would be from Alan Hunt. Oh, hi, following up on what Chanel said about presentation, it's important to keep in mind that um, in order to present as a gender and be recognized as such, there has to be a culturally shared notion of what that gender would present as, and that's not available to everybody. So you can't just look at how someone chooses to present and think that you know uh, how they intend to be understood by people. You have to listen to them and interact with them and find out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all good points. I think at the heart of this is respectful conversation. People should be taking each other into account as mutual people deserving of respect. Other questions? Hmm? But I do think that, that, yeah, respectful conversation is definitely a biggie. Do we got other questions? I'd like it to say a quick comment. Um, now, um, as as I've been growing up, um, all this is is new. I, I haven't really, um, for as my youth years, I haven't really uh, been through circumstances like this. But I have seen uh, other individuals that have been going through, like for as bullying and different things because of the person who they are, um, which uh, and then. At the moment, to be honest, I didn't know what was going on. Uh, we was growing up to be one thing, and and that's not the case in the world. But I, um, what I have uh, been able to learn over the past few years is that we are human, regardless of um, how we may identify each other as. We are human. We all have human rights, and we need to respect each other as such. Um, it's very important that we do get the pronouns right. It's very important that we get names right. Um, and it's uh, very important that we treat each other with love and uh, make sure that we treat each other regardless of how we may identify each other as a human being. So I just wanted to add that comment. Thank you. And anything that I didn't seem clear on, let me know, please, people. Just because I've been doing workshops on this stuff for nearly a quarter of a century doesn't mean A, that I'm perfect, or B, that everyone else has been doing it for 25 years or 25 minutes for all I know. I always go into a place assuming that I should assume nothing, pretend that these people never heard of this, and try to go from there. So we got anyone else? I love questions. Alan Hunter, um, you're up again. Yeah, this is not really a question, but I just finished reading this book, uh, Across the Green Grass Fields by Shannon McGuire. Um, it's the latest book in a series about children who uh, step through a door and end up in a different world and who feel like aliens in the world that we inhabit. And this particular book happens to feature an intersex main character and that's oh, cool. not 
entirely focused on intersex like that's what the book about it just treats uh an intersex character as a main character who gets to have adventures and go into a world and live with centaurs and minotaurs and all that um okay. like a anyway i wanted to recommend it and i just wrote a uh, book review about it and uh, if it's okay i'd like to post that in the chat the, the link can you uh, email that to me i don't my visual disability i don't see those chat things uh i will i have uh, your email somewhere so i'll send it to you well, uh, don't worry. If you want, you can throw my email up for people that might want it if it hasn't been flashed since I'm not seeing your screen. Okay. And no, thanks. I want to yes, check I can out do that, that now. Book. Now, the question. Mm -hmm. um, in regards to conflict resolution, um, what advice can you give in regards to that? You're breaking up and distorting a little. Could you repeat, please? Cynthia, Brian, Kate, or any ideas? Okay, could Conflict you please repeat resolution. the question? Yeah, it's still breaking Conflict up. Sorry. Resolution. Conflict resolution. Oh, okay. Now I'm hearing you. Ideas on conflict resolution. Well, that's the thing. I think that policies need to be either in place or put in place or drafted by workplaces. As I said, schools definitely need this. Uh, I live in a uh, in New York. We're starting to get all the laws to catch up to people's understanding of gender, including that you have people coming out on all this stuff as young as four in some cases. I've actually met parents of trans and gender non-conforming and non-binary four and five-year-olds. So first of all, it needs to be explained to all workplaces that people are okay as they are, that people are valid people, that their lives are valid, their experiences, their genders are valid and need to be respected. Then there needs to be something in place, some explicit mechanism for this is how we make sure people know to feel good about themselves. But we also do need mechanisms in place for okay, somebody's being disrespectful or someone's actually being a bully, this is how we're going to handle it. And it has to be handled in a way that makes it clear that the gender diverse people are being supported and the people who are behaving badly are not exactly, that the people who are behaving badly need to be made aware of their behavior. They need to stop doing it. And there needs to be something to correct that. I don't know on a case by case or across the board basis what people would expect on that, but it needs to happen. I'd love thoughts from any of the people here, what they think on this. Chanel Scott. Please. So there's something in education referred to as Title IX. It specifically references the um the illegality of discriminating against people based upon their gender. And it technically does cover gender discrimination that happens to boys, but most people do not understand this. The, the, the foundation and framework is there to easily protect trans and gender nonconforming children. The problem is, unfortunately, we have you know state legislators that are passing rules to codify into Title IX that the only valid form of sex or gender expression or identity is that which matches the child's birth certificate. I know that Ohio just passed a couple laws and Arkansas passed a couple laws and Texas passed a couple laws to that effect when they were making these rules to modify what's allowed with regard to school and I'm just thinking to myself that like it's not difficult to take someone's word at face value because it is extremely inconvenient and extremely difficult and takes a lot of work for people that are lying for people who are trying to do nefarious things under the guise of being 
not the gender they say they are to actually do that. Nobody has the time and or energy to try to do that JK Rowling stupid book nonsense. Oh, Most gender non-conforming children and transgender children are just trying to, you know, use the bathroom and not get, you know, shoved into a locker because they're trans. In the same way that you want to protect your kid, it shouldn't really matter how a kid genders themselves because that's a kid. And if you want your kids safe, you should want everybody else's kids safe too. I'm just saying. Over. No, thank you. Okay, I, I knew about Title IX, but there also need to be things in place so that your average uh, trans kid or gender nonconforming kid in their family shouldn't have to go straight to the regular courts or the appeals courts or the Supreme Court to sue the hell out of the school when the, the school should have something in place. The workplaces should have something in place that uh, happens below the federal level. And yeah, there are some really hateful stereotypes. J.K. Rowling, oh my God, I used to be a Potterhead. I even used to cosplay Snape and Trelawney. I can't even look at a Potter book anymore because of the horrible things that that woman is saying about women like me. <clears throat> and actually, I was, this is germane to workplace because I happen to be big in the science fiction, fantasy, role play, gaming communities. And most of them have been very good and very respectful on this. And it's caused a lot of pain in these communities for the stuff that rallying people like that have been saying. And conventions have actually, correct, a lot of science fiction conventions have drafted and crafted policies, gender affirmation, uh, redress of discrimination. There's codes of conduct, anti-oppression statements. People may giggle, but yes, the average sci-fi convention has often better policies on this than all of our politicians put together usually, and even some of our schools and average job kind of situations. And, I, and, and what, what you mentioned, Chanel, fits under also addressing all the stereotypes. When a stereotype gets raised, I feel it needs to be said. That is not true, particularly if it's a really harmful, really false stereotype, i.e., these people are going to do icky stuff to your kids. That's been used against every minority I can think of over the last, what, couple hundred years? That kind of stuff needs to be said flat. When that gets presented as a serious argument somewhere, the first thing needs to be done is to swat that with a fly swatter and say, no. We're not playing that. And that's, I think, what the biggest part of this is, making it clear. Bigotry will not be tolerated. People will not be discriminated against. People will be affirmed as they are. <clears throat> Any other questions or anything? Sorry, someone's trying to robocall my iPad. <laughs> Come on. Belinda, Belinda Davis has a question. Hi, yeah, I was actually, I'm really sorry. I was having trouble with the technology, so I came in very late and I'm not sure. No problem. I'm not on video because I had troubles with the tech. I just want to hear what you got <laughs> okay. to say, please. <laughs> um, but I just, I was just going to say, and again, you probably already said this, but as an historian, I always think it's interesting, you know, just how, um, you know, I mean, I think there's sometimes a tendency to think that gender has been fluid even over time, as, uh, over time in certain spaces. I mean, I think there's more recognition now of the ways that, you know, Europe kind of imposed a, a binary gender system um, on other parts of the world and, a, and in, in many senses, a gendered system altogether. Um, but the fact that also even in Europe that that gendered system was actually um, was was very different over time. Understanding of you know um, of a one sex and two sex model and these sorts of things. And um, I mean, I think it, it seems like growing awareness of you know of of that kind of history can also be ways 
to help people who have trouble maybe getting over this notion, you know, but, but this is, you know, this is the way it's always been, or, you know, this is, this is the, you know, the natural way and that kind of thing without recognizing that, you know, it's, it's always been, um, it's always been culturally constructed, right? Uh, my favorite color is the brightest, most shocking, in-your-face, glittery pink that you can concoct. And people might think, okay, that's definitely always been a girly color. No. I've read Victorian child-raising guides. That's, I'll actually quote one that Marjorie Garber has in her book, Vested Interests, uh, Cross-Dressing Cultural Anxiety. Uh, pink is a strong, decided, manly color, while blue is a passive, retiring color for girls. And then that was around the Victorian times, so we're talking between like 1840 and 1837, 1840, up till about 1901. Then you had that pink was seen for girls. Then you had in the 1950s, I've actually seen a book called Populux with an E on the end. I can't think of the author. Uh, has all the old ads and things from the 50s. And you had entire lines of men's shirts and business accessories being made in bright pink. So, yeah, none of this stuff is that it's always been that way. Uh, what's always been that way is people have always been diverse. The current word is intersex. The old word, which is not popular in the intersex community, is hermaphrodite from the Greek deity hermaphroditos. I, I bring that up to point out that people have been, there have been intersex people as long as there have been people. The old words, even the words that people don't like anymore, came about back in an old time. That's my point. There was an olden times that people at least sort of talked about this. So I'm always sadly amused when somebody says, all this stuff is so new. These trans people came out of nowhere. Or no. If you look back to any culture, any period in history, I'm a scholar of world mythology, and it pops up in world myth. Even the stuff we had to read in school, Oedipus Rex, the Seer Tiresias, is swapped back and forth by Zeus and Hera to figure out who gets more out of sex, and afterwards is depicted in art as an old man with old woman breasts. So none of the stuff is new is the point I'm making. And I think that's something that we should be acknowledging, that there have always been people who are gender diverse. So maybe we should try to have our policies, our expectations, our mechanisms catch up with something that people have at least been slightly aware of. As long as it's been history, as long as it's been writing, the ancient Sumerians talked about this stuff on their clay tablets. So maybe we should catch up. Anyone else? I love questions. I love comments. Apologies, I arrived in the middle, but I'm finding all this very interesting. So thank you. Thanks. No, whenever you came is whenever you came. And this is being recorded, so this will be put up later. Dorky pauses and stalls and all. I think that's also the point. We don't have to be perfect with all this. A presentation doesn't have to seem like it was made by some big uh, person who's been studying public speaking for 80 years. It just needs to be a heartfelt effort by people to educate each other and have a respectful conversation. Would that be your advice as well for dealing with the workplace? To be sincere, to be heartfelt, to be actually you know, honest and open, because that's really what it's about. It's removing some of those barriers of um, taboo subjects, talking about them and finding ways that we can uh, work together. Um, what other ideas are there for making it so that an environment is uh, safe and inclusive for everybody, regardless of their gender orientation and um, identity? I think moment. we've hit a lot on, oh, on a lot a of questions. Richard, uh, Richard has a question. Richard, oh uh, please. 
Hello, yeah, I'm uh, Richard Giovanoni from, uh, well, near north suburbs of Chicago, a green uh, member of the Cook County Green Party. Well, I'm coming here was, I guess I was for like nearly 25 years a member of the Communist Party from like 1980 to about mid 2000s. And uh, so I know I, I'll be 70 in uh, September. So I grew up with all the common uh, uh, homophobic ideas, attitudes, jokes, and things like that. So I admit that uh, that uh, coming out here was a bit of what, I, what the communists would call a control task, you know, kind of forcing myself uh, to deal with, uh, you know, things that I'm not necessarily that knowledgeable and maybe even a little bit uncomfortable on. So I know that I come from a, where I see the thing mostly in class struggle and uh, tend to to put that much more paramount over identity politics uh, when it comes to that. So I, you know, uh, that's my, that's been my background. I wouldn't have put things as crudely as uh, Ralph Nader did back, even back in those days, would have been more sensitive on the issue than what the way he raised it, but uh, probably not a whole lot better. So I know when I joined the, uh, the uh, NC as, as an alternate delegate in uh, April, you know, some of the discussion on the, uh, transition and things like that. I wasn't aware that, you know, that it really wasn't dealt with internally and in much in Illinois, because I, people who know Paula Bradshaw, I didn't, I just had seen her at a few meetings and her speaking kind of passionately on the issue at, I think the last vert, uh, intendance we meet uh, in a uh, live meeting we had in uh, like February of 2020. So I'm mostly here to understand. And, you know, I realized that when I came on that the, I thought there was an over broad use of or quick too broad use of dealing with the, the, the uh, term hate speech, because I'm one that likes to use things not like the, like with fascism, I try not to use it very often and try to use it where it fits. So it doesn't become like a word that loses some of its meaning because it's overused. Uh, even though I understand that uh, something that, uh, I might not consider rise to the level of hate speech. Other people from their background or their, you know, uh, think can can be very sensitive to. So that's you know the, the sensitivity on those issues is something that I'm trying to learn because I know when I was collecting signatures to put the uh, Metropolitan Water Di Reclamation District candidates on the thing at the uh, Morton Grove uh, Metro train station, uh, I'm old school, so I would say. Uh, uh, good morning, sir, or good morning, ma'am. In one case, I called somebody a sir that was, wasn't a sir. So I think now that I've learned that I have to leave out those uh, sirs and ma'ams and just say hello, uh, you know, when I'm trying to get somebody to sign a petition. So I'm, you know, I'm trying to uh, change myself into uh, recognizing uh, those levels of, uh, you know, uh, of non-sensitivity that, that, I, that, I've, that I've grown up with. So that's why I'm here to kind of try to learn and uh, admit that there's a lot for me to learn and that I don't necessarily fully understand. So thank you. Put that out there. No, thank you. That's that's what I'm. That's what I think should be asked for. That people are willing to confront their discomfort with things. People are willing to confront their lack of knowledge on things. And yeah, there's a difference between accidental misgendering, which can be apologized for in a conversation. And intentional misgendering. When somebody's saying, oh, I don't consider this person the gender they are. No, that's not right. And hate speech, I know people say the word gets overused, but calling a transgender woman a man, that's hate. That's disrespecting a trans woman's womanhood and saying that they don't have the right to be women, which is not good. Uh, in the case, it, too many murders okay, of we have three trans women, they back. say that wasn't a woman. So that's why we need to be respectful and we need to confront the, just what we don't know. As long as the conversation is civil and well-intentioned, any missteps can usually be apologized and worked from as long as people are willing to actually be respectful. I think, that, I think that's the one word that sums us all up is to be respectful. If you mess up, apologize and try to move on. As long as you're not just outright saying, I don't respect you. As long as you're not doing that, anything is usually possible. Does that mean, I hope I'm making sense with that. 
No. Yes, we have some people that are on stack. Um, if you could verbalize, who still has a question or wants to make a comment? Um, I just have a short comment. I was going to say one of the easier ways to make workplaces and schools a little bit easier to deal with, it, particularly with younger children, is just in a crowd of people default to people and they and don't necessarily push the idea that certain toys or things go with certain other genders because if you let kids play how they want to play they'll figure it out and if you yeah. don't gender toys and other things it'll just be easier for kids to find what they enjoy doing and do that without stigma over what group was, I forget the name of the group, but they were trying to uh, take all the gender labels off the toy aisles. Alan Hunter, you'd be next. Um, yeah, we're often portrayed as fragile snowflakes, as people for whom safe spaces have to be created and everyone else has to start walking on eggshells lest they accidentally say the wrong things. Um, and sometimes that's true when we're first dealing with this, uh, when we're processing a lifetime of being made to feel like there's something wrong with us, it can be something where we're very vulnerable to the things that are uh, intentionally or unintentionally hurtful in how people put them into words. Um, but I think you haven't heard a whole lot of people here um, so much um like snowflakes about to to melt in the sun um i don't think any of us are obligated to deal with people whose interaction with us comes across as hateful or intolerant but i think most of that hate and intolerance uh, underneath the outside layers always turns out to be fear um and I'm not scared of them. Um, I'll go into places where people are intolerant and interact with them and let them be the, the ones on the defensive and um, hear them out and see if I can get them to, to rearrange their thinking. I have one Amy? quick thing to say is I was in a game group where someone kept calling me a guy. They didn't mean to be hateful. So I just uh, shot the whole thing down with humor, telling them as about my character, the lady dwarf will heal anyone who calls her a woman. <laughs> and now we're ready for Amy. Uh, again, good morning. Sorry, I'm late. I just wanted to put it out there in case nobody's brought it up that there's often a real dilemma when we're talking about uh, identity because, oh, excuse me, I'm being cat bombed because <laughs> on one hand, do you mind? He's politically unaffiliated uh, because on one hand, we you know, it's a serious issue. We're facing a lot of these issues within the Green Party as well as in other areas. And it's worth discussing and pulling apart and, you know, trying to improve. And on the other hand, we do often see opportunists that only want to bring up identity when they're ready to smear us. And I find that an unfortunate situation. I would welcome our uh, moderator's input about how they feel that the best way to handle that would be. Thanks. Okay, does that for me or for you? Either one. My, um, I'll go first. Don Marie, I really have a problem with my own personal life with people trying to smear my identity and uh, damage my reputation. If it's a situation that I can resolve, if it's a situation that I can actually have a conversation with the person, I try to do so. If it's a situation that I really can't control, say it's something that's said on Facebook that's gone viral, I ignore it. I put out my own statement and I just let it go. Um, there's no sense yeah. in continuously trying to battle something that it's a personal opinion anyway, and you're not able to, um, it's like putting more effort into a sand hourglass. That's just, nothing's coming of it except you're wasting your time. Um, Cynthia Brian-Kate? 
I find that speaking the truth about my experience and my life and my feelings on such things usually gets people wanting to know more about me, and they kind of forget the hype if anybody's been spreading something about me. And I've found that actually has worked a lot of good. I've had people tell me, oh, I've heard all this bad stuff about you, but you're not that horrible person. You're funny, and you're cool, and you're weird, and I want to talk to you. I've even used that to win over, of all things, a right-wing pastor who'd actually tried hosting anti-gay stuff at his church. And just by talking to him for half an hour, somehow I found myself receiving Christmas cards from a guy uh, with notes basically saying how uh, proud he is that he talked to a woman like me. And I'm like, wow. So I really think that speaking the truth, speaking your truth, your experience, and how this all this stuff makes you feel does get people wanting to know your side of things without you having to basically do like a National Enquirer ad saying, oh, my God, what the bleep. Um, if I may just add to that, <laughs> it's not two things. It's never a trans or intersex person's business or job to teach you how to be a person. But also, if people are coming to at the Green Party to smear us for understanding how human rights work and how saying that you need to respect people as you want to be respected, they're bad people. They're jerks. We don't have to kowtow to them because they're trying to change the 10 key values that made this party, that w this party was founded on. You know, you kind of get where I'm yeah. coming from. Thank you. Yes, thank you everyone. And again, I apologize for the cat bombing there. Oh, cats bomb all our Zooms, Amy, you're fine. <laughs> No one should ever apologize for having cute cats. Heck, it's what the internet runs on. All those, all those little wildcat guys saying, I can have cheeseburger. <laughs> and thanks, Chanel, because that's the thing. I will gladly talk about my life and my experience because I feel it's helping the conversation, it's helping people understand. But no, that is not the job of every intersex, transgender, gender nonconforming, or non-binary person. And there are some questions that it's okay to ask. Like, what should I call you? What name do you want me to use? There are questions you should not just be asking somebody, like what's in your pants? I think that's a pretty, that's one of the quickest and, uh, you know, pointed ways I can point that out. Cause, and other things that seem less clear, okay, can I ask this or not? Well, you um, can ask, can I ask you about this? We have another question from Alan Hunter. Cool. Okay, Alan? please, I'd love to hear. Oh, it helps if I, uh, <laughs> uh, if I unmute, unmute myself. Um, here on the left, we've uh, been aware ever since Marx that um, notions about the difference between the rich and the poor uh, accusations that the poor are just lazy people and stuff like that it's not just an attitude problem it's part of the social structure that that ideology is needed uh, by the system in order to perpetuate the uh, the oppressions in question um well since feminism we've been aware of a similar thing with regards to gender polarization it's not just uh nasty um uh, intolerant attitudes on a personal level by people um that insist on a, um a, a rigid identity that you're born with and uh, that that defines you for the rest of your life. It's actually a social structure that's intrinsically dependent on that in order to perpetuate uh, the inequalities that are based on it. Um, so we're playing with fire here. And uh, it's important to keep that in mind some of the time when we run into the opposition, that it's not just a personal opposition we're running into, it's political by its very nature. Wow. So in essence, also 
sometimes this a really a education and their bias, their the stereotypes that they learned when they were a child. And sometimes those are the hardest ones for a person to look at. What are the recommendations so that you can actually help somebody learn a little bit better ways to associate with the situation of a coworker who is most definitely looking feminine but dresses in guys clothes all the time or vice versa we have that happening all the time and we don't think nothing of it but back uh, maybe 10 15 years ago that was a little bit more of an issue cynthia what advice can you give on that i still think respectful conversation and that includes also, though, making it clear that people's gender is affirmed. <clears throat> what you identify as, what you express as is protected. And we've even got a Supreme Court decision that supports this in workplaces. Bostock v. Clayton, sadly, the trans woman who instituted the suit did not live to see this justice. But uh, as of last, was it last year, I think? Yeah, I think sometime last year that you are not allowed to fire a person for their gender identity or expression. You can't fire particularly transgender people. Uh, we still do not have something like the Equality Act in place as a law covering everything, but there are some laws and precedents like this. There are non-discrimination laws in a lot of states and localities. So make it, it needs to be made clear that discrimination will not be tolerated that the person whose gender is not as easy for people to figure out has every right to be who they are and express who they are. And that it's one thing, okay, we'll have a sensitivity training. Okay, we'll have a Q&A kind of thing. But when it comes down to it, the attitude of any workplace has to be, this person gets respected. This person is not to be messed with. No negotiation on that part of it. firm, emphatic statement that people are to be respected and treated with dignity, whatever gender they are. We have about 15 more minutes. Um, is there anything else that we want to uh, discuss in this workshop? Are there any other questions that anyone would like to bring up at this time? I can do my usual anyone, viewer, viewer. And Amy, you're up. Uh, I may have missed this because of my uh, tardiness, but if anybody has any good reading material, I'm always looking for that online, offline. Uh, please feel free to place it in the chat and I'll uh, jot it down for future reference. Thanks. There are so many books and websites. I really should uh, look through what more current ones are. I put together lists like this in the past. The thing is, books go in and out of print. Websites go in and out of being. I would love help from some people I know in the party who have the time to help me put together a more current and uh, accurate uh, you know, list of what the better websites, books, movies, and such are. I know Thanks, ones everyone. I can think of, but I got to check whether they are in and out of print or what. And Belinda has uh, to help with that. Um, I'll just uh, translate to Don real quick. Don says from the Belinda chat. Belinda has online. offered to help with that. Hello? Am I still on? I hope everything distorted. No, everything is fine. Don is just a little there you are. Belinda said in chat that she's down to help you come up with the list and Alan Hunter suggested a sissy by 
Let me check the name of this author, Jacob Toba. Tobia? Not familiar. I mean, I'm so I'm always glad to know that there are all these books and movies and websites that I haven't heard of. When I was when I was first co- growing up and coming out on all this in 1995, 1996, I couldn't find nothing. Back when Borders was around, I was geeked that I literally tripped into an entire small room of books. I haven't been to a bookstore lately. I hope that's still the case. I would love to have something compiled because I know that there are reading lists suggested to the party, but I do think we should have one that covers this particularly. Got any other questions? There is another book um, that Alan has just offered us in the chat. Uh, that is Gender Queer by Maya Kobabe. Kobabe? Um, yep, we have 10 minutes left. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about in regards to uh, the this topic, uh, Cynthia? Is there anything that any of y'all think I haven't covered enough or haven't covered at all? I mean, this is such a broad topic. There's so much that can be covered. I always assume that I'll cover as much as I can in the time I got. So do we have anyone else? Don Marie, is there anything that you're surprised that hasn't come up or that you think could be more clear or anything? I'm going to pass. I'm really having a hard time with uh, um, breathing right now, dealing with seasonal allergies. But Chanel definitely has her hand up and would like to talk. Chanel? Yeah, um, I was just thinking about it. Like, I feel like most people don't understand that, like, as people that are trying to be allies to the transgender, nonconforming, and intersex communities, of which I'm kind of a part of, but it's complicated. We need to be willing to be capable and able to defend the idea and concept of our our friends. You, it basically comes down to treating people as you would want to be treated in their shoes. None of us as green should be okay with the notion that there are people going around trying to say that transgender men don't exist and transgender women aren't women and that, you know, our very existence is somehow taking rights away from cisgender women. Because not only is that inaccurate, that is harmful information that is, again, the fruit of a hate crime the words, those words like that, the notion that cisgender people are somehow losing rights because transgender people exist in public, that's something that will, honest to goodness, create a situation where if you let that continue, you'll have people trying to pass laws saying that trans people basically can't leave their house. And a lot of those Christian fascist groups are trying to do that. So as Greens, because we are activists and because most of us actually truly believe in these tinky values, we got to be ready to confront whoever to tell them that they're not right and it's not welcome here, but that's just me. And maybe I'm just a confrontational person. Over. No, you are wonderful. Thank you. I think people need to respect that gender is complicated. I think that it's complicated isn't just a relationship tag on that stupid Facebook program, but that is what it is for a lot of people. I mean, in my case, I'm intersex and I'm a trans woman and that confuses everybody. Hell, it confuses me half the time, but I'm kind of used to it. And yeah, being an ally includes, if nothing else, when somebody says something completely just redonkulously hateful, like all the examples you just cited, to simply say, dude, that ain't cool. That alone is an act of allyhood. And 
activists uh, trying to at least get a tiny bit of justice for people. And this party needs to know, this party needs to be at the forefront of advocating on respect and dignity for people on all the gender categories and such, because it's in our actual values, pillars, platform, policy statements, all of it. The rules of this party say you have to respect people's gender and you don't get to discriminate. And anybody who's in this party who thinks otherwise, well, they're welcome to think it, but they're not allowed to act it. You can say whatever you want in your own house, but if you put it in print, particularly on an email form, particularly on something that goes into the Green Party, no, that is not good and that is not acceptable. I'm glad that this party has all this stuff on paper, and I'm glad that we're working to make all this stuff actually be put in place for real. And I look forward to seeing it be even more the case that people are more accepting, people are more respectful, people are more willing to walk the talk this party has. In a couple minutes we got left, do we have anyone and anything I might not have covered? Chanel has a hand raised up. Please. Oh, I meant to put my hand down. Oops. Okay. Pity all your suggestions and comments and questions have been wonderful. Yeah, anybody has anything further? Question, comment, anything? I'd love to hear it in a couple minutes we got left. I don't want anyone to feel that they got left out just because I didn't know that you asked it. I just want to say that I do really appreciate the questions that came from this workshop and how you managed to break down all this information and the amount of time given. You've definitely gotten better at giving these workshops on Zoom. Thank and you. The vulnerability of the other people who've taken the time to be part of this website to ask these difficult questions and see like where they need to try to improve or how, because a lot of people just get uncomfortable and don't want to confront like why they're concerned and not sure what to do. A lot of people let their discomfort, you know, manifest and lash out in a way that actually hurts people. Whereas everyone who's come in this room is actively here for the purpose of learning and really trying to be better so that we're safe for everyone. And I just super appreciate that. As someone who has to work with the caucus of younger people where over half of the active membership in certain states are all little trans teenagers, this makes me feel so much better because, you know, I'd be worried. I don't want to send them into hostile state parties. And I'm seeing that there are leaders here in state parties that are like, getting their crap together in a way that means that they're going to be safe to come and interact with you guys, which is the main thing that worries me a lot. Over. No, thank you. And I, okay, I admit technology uh, confuses the heck out of me. Not, it's not always that accessible to a legally blind person like me. So I'm glad that from what you said that I'm getting better at this Zoom thingy. And I, I will say that at least this workshop, I've heard nothing but respectful kind, well-meaning people who want to learn more about this. And by the way, my email should hopefully still be somewhere in that chat thing. I want y'all to send me anything you want to say after this is done. I would much rather open my inbox to be hearing from you folks than just the usual junk I get from all the e-lists I'm on. Uh, Don Marie, how much time we got left? I kind of take my watch off when I do these. We got uh, two minutes left. 
Okay, I'm going to be bright and do the whole speak now or forever hold your peace, at least for this workshop today. Anybody got anything left in the two minutes we got? Thank you, Cynthia. That wasn't to cut off anybody else's final questions or comments. I just wanted to take the opportunity. Thank you. Yes, thanks. You're uh, welcome. I hope to see some of you all over the weekend. Unfortunately, I'll be working on Friday, but maybe we'll get to uh, hang out again on Saturday or Sunday. Thanks for having me. Email me whenever you got time. Thanks. Bye all. Thanks. Bye guys. I got a 